You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Peter Mann on the show with me. He has an amazing new book. It's called The Torqued Man. And I, I'll tell you what, Peter, um, when I first got this book, um, when I first dove into it, I didn't know what to think of it. Um, it it's one of those books that you start reading, and it's a collection of uh, of like found journals and and things like that, and and you you start getting into it and you start looking over your shoulder, you know, uh, to see if anybody's watching. Am I supposed to be reading this? Um, <laughs> you know, and it just kind of sucks you into the story in that way. Really, one of the most unique books. Um, I you know I know it's just January, but uh, this is is very high uh, on my 2022 books. I know already, um, and I know everyone else out there is going to love the book as well. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks so much, Hank. That's uh, it's so wonderful to hear. I'm glad. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that you dug the whole found artifact uh, aspect of the book. That's something that I'm always kind of seduced by in fiction is the is, is the kind of presentation of of something real and discovered. Maybe the historian made the idea of uh, of presenting something as as fabricated history, which is I, I always find kind of enticing. It it absolutely is, and in such a unique way. It's uh. Uh, you know, it it really it it scratches um, a, a certain part of, uh, of of our personality, I guess. That um, you know that this is this is something I'm not supposed to know about, but here I am, and I don't know. It's 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 uh, it's exciting in that way. It's uh, it's a really unique way, and I, I love what you've done with it. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah. I think it's something about that you know sense, especially in historical fiction, that you're you know, discovering a, a lost world. And so the idea of, of found manuscripts, I think, plays up to that. Absolutely. And there's plenty for us to talk about. But before we do, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, man, my first memory. I, I have a feeling there are some buried memories in there that I don't have access to. Um, but you know, growing up, I was always interested in writing. It was always something that I enjoyed doing. You know, any kind of school assignment that had a creative writing aspect to it, I was just all over it. Uh, generally preferred to work on my own. The idea of a collaborative group work with creating stories or something that really bothered me, which I think was a sign that it was something that was really, you know, precious to me. Um, but the first thing I remember actually working on totally unprompted and that it wasn't an assignment. It was just something I set out to do on my own was I must have been about 10 years old, uh, something around there, uh, and I decided to write a a parody movie script, essentially a kind of uh, parody of a Rambo movie. All my favorite action movies kind of mashed up into one. Steven Seagal, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Sylvester Stallone. Uh, and, you know, it had, of course, trademark 10-year-old humor. Uh, so my movie was called Dumbo instead of Rambo, which was, of course, an acronym <laughs> for... <laughs> Uh, if I remember right, it was dumb, unintelligent, moronic battle operator. hadn't hadn't quite mastered the, uh, uh, the you know the problem of of repetition in language, but a redundancy. Um, so I wrote that as as like I don't think I actually finished the script, but I think I wrote like thirty or forty pages on in our family desktop in the basement, the kind where. It, you know, to print it out, it came out like with a perforated um, paper on the sides. If you recall that, and it comes right. out, the printer was, you know, line by line. You heard that. Duh, 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 the, duh. the dot matrix. <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There was something so satisfying about that. I saw like when, when I remember like printing out the, the 30 pages I had uh, just to see, you know, my wild ideas and, and kooky dialogue and jokes in objectified form on the page coming from this machine. It was something very intoxicating for me. I love that. I, I love that you have a a specific memory of, you know, kind of when, when this thing started coming alive and you, 
um, take that that feeling, that memory uh, that you have, and now juxtapose that against um, the fact that you hold a PhD in modern European history. Um, h- how do those two intersect? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. You know, I think that that question was something I was trying to answer for myself for a number of years. Um, in the sense, I, I know I was always interested in history uh, as a kid the, from from the very get go. I've always been interested in the world wars, um, the the 19th century, but really all of it. I have very wide ranging general tastes, which I think is part of the reason I, I uh, haven't been comfortable being a a, a academic historian. Um, but I was drawn to uh, just to to figures and, and ideas from the past. And the reason I ended up getting a PhD in modern European history, I think I think I always had the writing impulse. I think by the time I graduated college and was trying to figure out what the hell to do with my life, uh, somehow, this was probably a miscalculation, but somehow it occurred to me that uh, becoming a novelist, whatever whatever that entailed, other than sitting down and cranking out a, a publishable book, which seemed certainly beyond me in my 20s, um, somehow there was a more established path to say becoming, uh, you know, a historian, get go into graduate school, getting a PhD, where they, if you got into the right program, they paid for you to go to school. Um, needless to say, I didn't have any real professional aspirations at the time. I just wanted to stay in school, stay in an environment where I could read a lot more books, dive into literature and philosophy, which is something I had just kind of started devouring by the end of high school and into college, and I didn't want to give it up for, you know, workaday drudgery. So uh, history served me well in that sense. I, I kind of chose history because, it, uh, and I ended up focusing on modern European history, modern European intellectual history, which is essentially a history of ideas, literature, philosophy, history of intellectuals. And so that kind of gave me a very um, access to all those different disciplines I was interested in, and was really great kind of training ground for becoming a, a writer of historical fiction, I'd say, both in terms of, of of just wide breadth of reading and as well as like kind of getting deeply acquainted with certain moments from the past. How modern is uh, modern European history considered? Oh, yeah, good question. Of course, that's the subject of, uh, of you know endless debate among historians. Um, but they, they divided modernity in the historical discipline into early modern and modern. And usually early modern is considered roughly, say, uh, the Renaissance up through the scientific revolution to the enlightenment. And then modern takes over really from the enlightenment and the French revolution up to contemporary moments. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, yeah so my, so my, my bread and butter in terms of, uh, what I was focusing on when I was in graduate school and what I still sometimes teach today is 19th and 20th century European literature, philosophy, kind of history of ideas and context um, with a particular focus on Germany and Spain. But like I said, my interest all over the place and I, I'm fortunate in that I'm able to teach um, in, in a program where I teach very broadly. I teach essentially Homer uh, and Plato up through contemporary writers like uh, Valeria Luiselli and, uh, and people who are writing in the current day. So it serves my, my generalist uh, disposition pretty well. Yeah, that's that's about as broad as as <laughs> as you can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, that I, I'm that's fascinating, Peter, and um and that obviously has served you well um with the book that you've written because it it definitely falls into um you know this early 20th century um uh you know milieu. Um, did uh it, you know, over the last couple of years, we, we've done over 1,200 episodes of the show and uh, over eight years, and um, th- we've seen some trends rise and fall. And um, one trend that has uh, risen over the last several years and is, um, you know, just fire hot over the last couple of years is uh, uh, World War II historical fiction. And there just seems to be story after story that that uh, are are mining this uh, this fertile um, you know uh, time period for for stories what I, one thing I like to ask um, authors is why do you think we're fascinated with this time period you know we're um, we're a hundred years uh, and more past World War one we're we will be a hundred years. Uh, you know, on World War II in, in the next couple of decades, we're, we're quickly approaching. 
Um, why, why now? Why do you think that that there are so many people that are fascinated with this time period, and 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 readers obviously or writers wouldn't be, um, you know, writing to to scratch that itch, um, in, or so to speak. Um, so there's there's a market for it. I guess is what I'm what I'm saying. It's not just a few people that have these great ideas. People are buying these books and and wanting more. Um, why are we fascinated with this time period? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and first of all, let me just say, wow, over 1,200 episodes in eight years. That's awesome. You're you're an institution. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I I wonder that myself. It's certainly something, I and mean, I've been fascinated with World War II and kind of the, the, the period between the wars uh, for as long as I can remember. So for me, it's not, it, it's it's a no-brainer. I don't, um, it's interesting to say that. I, I wasn't even aware that there, there's a kind of an increased trend, I guess probably because it's always been an object of fascination for me. But it makes perfect sense. I think part of it is, at least for me, it seems like the Second World War is still uh, still kind of a, a a fresh scar, not even a scar, maybe still, a, you know, a, a wound that hasn't yeah. fully healed in terms of our collective conscious and, and unconscious, uh, you know, not just in Europe, but it, it really was a global war. And I think we're still living with the repercussions of that. It's something that, you know, I think unlike the First World War, which is, of course, a, a huge rupture, transformative event, um, also globally, especially in Europe. But I think that for some reason that the the first world war seems almost like the the death of the old world and what comes out of the you know the 20th century in some sense like begins in earnest in in the the wake of the destruction of the first world war and and then and of course the seeds of the second world war are, are, are sown in there as well and so i think the the second world war is is kind of the you know the the traumatic um moment of our kind of the beginning of whatever we've been living in for the last century that that's sort of incarnation of our of our life together. Um, and so I think I think we can't help but use it as a kind of touchstone, right, to understand who we are and what our problems are and what we've inherited. And and I mean, and I think that maybe this is fueling the current trend you're seeing is that our sadly, our our you know current world is coming closer and closer to resembling certain aspects of the interwar period and the rise of fascism and authoritarianism and uh, you know mass mobilization anti democratic populist movements that uh, that brought about the second world war and so i think there's an impulse among novelists um, as well as historians i think they share this right to to try to understand our present as you know refracted through the prism of of the past and so world war 2 helps us kind of see ourselves th through that moment insofar as it resonates um speaking of world war one kind of being the death of the old world as, as a lot of people have seen it um I, i'm reminded of of the lord of the rings and and how tolkien um you know was inspired by his time in the trenches of world war one and this uh this you know the story that's almost allegorical even though you know tolkien pushed very hard against the idea of allegory uh, in lord of the rings but um it it very much kind of resonates that way that uh you know he's he's kind of lamenting uh, the death of a simpler time and and um you know what is to come uh in it, it, it i find it fascinating that, that you bring that up and, and just to, to look back and see how those ideas kind of permeate all of literature and art and uh you know the the way that it comes out in interesting ways. Yeah, totally. I mean, even like you said, the the fiction that doesn't really sh show on its sleeve that it's say you know about uh, you know recent history, something like Tolkien fantasy is still deeply informed by that, for sure. So, as a as a, a person who's fascinated with history, and um, you know, especially uh, you know modern history, but but with some distance. Uh, on it, and someone who's fascinated with storytelling, how did how did the ideas for this book first start to to coalesce? I'm 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 fascinated by the beginnings of things. You know, at one moment in time, the torqued man does not exist in any form or fashion. It just it doesn't exist. And then either uh, you know a character walks onto the stage of your mind, or um, you start thinking uh, you know about historical 
events and, and how a character might weave through there or, or, or whatever. And then, you know, in one instant, this book does exist. And then it's your job as the writer to kind of excavate the stories and put it all together. What, what was that first moment for you? Can, can you trace it back to where this book became alive? Yeah, I, I think I can. In this case, it's I think sometimes it's you know, kind of inchoate where uh, an, a seed of an idea originates. But in, in this particular case, uh, it was pretty concrete in that I was reading about the Spanish Civil War, a topic I, I've been interested in for a while. And I can't remember where I first came across the name, but I, I read about a guy named Frank Ryan, an Irish Republican and socialist who went over to Spain in 36 to fight the fascists. Um, and I was kind of, I was immediately interested and kind of enamored of him because I read that he had, he had essentially mustered a, a, a bunch of fellow Irishmen and formed what was called the Connolly Column, um, uh, part of the international brigades fighting to defend the Republic. And um, he, I had read that he essentially, he had gone over to Spain to fight the Irish fascists who were mustered by a guy named Ono Duffy. Uh, and so they essentially was kind of carrying his 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 fight within um, that from, from the streets of Ireland over into Spain, kind of fighting the, the same enemy, um, like and like so many Europeans ended up in, in Spain during the Civil War. In any event, um, when I read about Frank Ryan's uh, ordeal, which was that he was fought in Spain, was captured by the Italians, uh, sentenced to death in, uh, by Franco, had his death sentence commuted and, and basically left to rot in prison uh, for uh, forever until lo and behold in 1940, who should come to offer him his freedom but the Germans, the Abwehr, the German Military Intelligence Service. Uh, why they were interested is they, they wanted to recruit Frank Ryan to uh, help coordinate their planned invasion of Britain. This was early in the war still. This is before the invasion of the Soviet Union. And of course, the invasion of Britain never happened. But, uh, uh, you know, Ryan, of course, he, he was faced with this impossible choice in the sense that he, he was given the chance to, you know, rot to death in, in a, a Francoist prison or join the, the forces of, of the fascists, the people he loathed. Um, but he, he saw it as an opportunity to, to fight for the independence of Ireland. The idea being that if, uh, if you know, if, if, if Ireland and, and IRA was able to help with the, the defeat of Britain, then Germany could help, you know, end partition, unite our, the North, Northern Ireland with the rest of it. Um, of course, none of this happens. So he was left to kind of left on ice in Germany. And the real figure Frank Ryan ended up dying in Germany, just kind of fell sick by the end of the war. So a lot of the basic premise it, I, I lifted from this man's incredible biography. Um, and it just struck me when I remember reading about it. I think I was even maybe still at that time fishing for, do I, do I want to work on, a, on a, another kind of history project? Um, but as soon as I read this, it just screamed to me that this was a, a perfect kind of opportunity for a novel, and it, it posed the, it, it offered this um, this predicament of, of these really you know impossible choices, um, and of course posed the question of what was a guy like an Irish Republican and a socialist who made this Faustian bargain and went over to the side of his enemies. Um, what's he really up to for the duration of the war while he's supposedly just kind of twiddling his thumbs in Berlin? And that that question just kind of opened up everything for me. Um, it led me to read uh, then the Dig Deeper. I read a couple of biographies about Ryan uh, that uh, written in Ireland. Um, and then I, I ended up looking in the archives. The UK National Archives was able to read all the interrogation reports of uh, of this guy's German spy handler. And that was in another kind of clicking moment is the idea of, of the relationship between the spy handler and his Irish charge and allowed me to open to kind of uh, imagine a whole series of, uh, you know, of, of, of interactions and a whole complex relationship that wasn't really in the documents at all, but but just enough to kind of <clears throat> trigger my imagination. Dabble is a proud sponsor of Author Stories. Dabble is an easy-to-use cloud-based writing tool that gives writers a way to organize, plot, and create amazing stories wherever they are. 
right in our desktop app on your Mac or Windows computer, tablet, or mobile device. Dabble syncs your latest version with the cloud on all your devices. Right anywhere and anytime inspiration strikes. We got you. Dabble is my preferred writing tool, and I think it will be yours as well. Visit DabbleWriter.com for your free trial. So in the, in the world of writing, we have these two camps of people that we uh, that we love to drop writers in uh, the the pantser camp and the plotter camp. And, uh, you know, do you write by the seat of your pants and the story just unfolds as you write it? Or do you plan it out beforehand uh, and then write to that uh, to that outline with a book like The Torqued Man that is is full of. Uh, found manuscripts and journal entries and things like that. Um, did 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 you just collect these and, and and write these as they came to mind? Did did you have a plan and then you know crafted these sort of entries to to fill in that plan? What what is the what's the writing like for a book of this style? Yeah, um, you know, I th- I think I fall somewhere in between. I'm. Uh, and I think most people do. Yeah. I have trouble, I think, in all aspects of my lifetime declaring myself like firmly in one camp. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like to waffle, you know, on the margins or in the in-betweens. Um, with with this kind of book, you know, I, I I did still strive to write it in a kind of start to finish manner. The, the idea of writing something, even a book that ends up looking more like a, a, a pastiche uh, and certainly this like the, the way I kind of the parts of the story that fit together for me, certainly I, I use a kind of collage effect, right, of drawing from seemingly disparate things and, and, and putting them all together in, in hopefully artful combination. But um, I like to proceed with the writing in a fairly linear fashion, like start from what I think is the first moment, which not necessarily the first moment in chronology, but the first moment for me was uh, our, our, one of our protagonists, Adrian de Groot, uh, the, our, our German uh, Abwehr agent, it, to, starting with the diary entry um, that begins with, I'm not giving any away here because it's the first sentence of the novel, but it begins with the line that Frank Pike is dead, and Frank Pike being the, the, the Irish spy. Uh, and so it, it begins with a recounting of, of this man's life and the relationship. And I imagine that it just be kind of the, the kind of fraught moment in which he's writing this diary occurred to me is this is happening during the bombing of Berlin in November of 1943, um, after, kind of after a turning point in the war when when Germany's all of Germany's advances uh, kind of been reversed and now Berlin itself is under fire, um, and, and and this kind of embattled you know stuck in in the basement kind of mentality. Um, of looking back and taking account. So that that was my starting point. Um, and I tried, as I recall, I, I wrote, um, I didn't I didn't want to, the, the, so the novel toggles back and forth, like chapter to chapter between these two different voices, two different perspectives from uh, the German, Adrian de Groot, and uh, the Irishman, Frank Pike, who's writing his, his kind of larger than life, Celtic hero alter ego Finn McCool writing about himself in, in the third person, but I didn't write the the narratives originally in that toggling back and forth fashion. I, I tried to write at least I think a hundred pages or so, some kind of um, substantial down payment on just say Adrian's voice, and then I went back and I thought, okay, well here I've laid the groundwork here. Now how can I now I'll write the Finn McCool narrative, um, and I'll and it became kind of fun and easy, you know, writing to kind of like f- fit together like a puzzle piece with the Adrian narrative, and and that and that became really fun to talk think about uh, how do these two narrate the same ostensible set of events in in a different way, right? How does their perception of what really happened or what the motivation was change? So the the Finn McCool narrative kind of started as almost as reactions to Adrian's uh, account. And then once I had down payments on both of those, I was able then to kind of finesse writing the two of them in an intertwined fashion. You mentioned a minute ago, Peter, that um, that you were trying to decide if, uh, you know, you wanted to, to dig into more of a, a history project or, or something else. W- was yeah. there a moment uh, in in, in the writing of this project that you realized um, 
okay, th- this is going to be a thing. Like that, I I can see an, an end to this, and I can see my way through this. Or did you know that from the very beginning? Did you know that you know I, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna go all the way through that? Or was there a testing phase of this idea to see if it had legs or not? Yeah, and well, you know, in terms of the plot, I think a, a lot of um, a lot of it kind of came to me as I was writing. I knew I knew kind of the relationship, but right? I knew there was going to be, and, and I, like I said, I could, um, uh, I had it made somewhat easy for me that I could follow, at least in the beginning, the scaffolding of this real historical figure's life, right? His predicament. He gets pulled out of prison in Spain, brought to Berlin. And I thought, just like, how does this relationship between these two men unfold um, given those circumstances, right? And, and then I also had the backdrop of the war and the kind of changing um, landscape <clears throat> in terms of, you know, they're the, the planning all these operations for for um, sending Frank Pike to to Germany, I mean, excuse me, to, to Ireland, um, that falls through. So I had a lot of things kind of the history was helping me um, structure. Um, but then within that, uh, I was, uh, in, I had so much fun just kind of drawing from various readings I, I had done that I, I had done a while ago and recalled and like, oh, maybe there's something there. Like, for instance, um, Theodore Morel, who is was Hitler's personal physician, ends up coming to play an, an important role in this book. And uh, I had read this fascinating book from a few years ago called Blitzed, Drugs in the Third Reich. Uh, by a man whose name I believe is Norman Oler. Uh, anyways, it was all about like the role that, that drugs played and just the kind of in- incredible preponderance of all these high-powered pharmaceuticals uh, in Nazi Germany and and then focused on the, uh, this crazy figure of, of Hitler's personal doctor. Uh, and and somehow I found a kind of spot for that and that like opened up a, a new kind of horizon in terms of plot. Um, the other thing that I think helped me with um, with plot uh, even though this is more kind of a question of, of character or voice, was uh, I had read some years ago uh, this fantastic book, one of my favorite novels by Flan O'Brien called At Swim Two Birds. Do you know it? I've heard of it, yeah. It's great. It's it's hilarious. It's it's a, a Irish modernist novel from the late 30s, I think 39. Um, this guy was a contemporary of Joyce. It's just kind of hilarious and crazy. One of the things he he uh, does is he he does this kind of mock heroic voice of the ancient Celtic hero Finn McCool. Um, he, he's one of the, the one of his characters' uh, kind of literary voices. And so I thought, wouldn't that be interesting if if this Irishman is writing his own story, but he wants to kind of tell it, you know, tell it slant and tell it refracted through myth. But it would be a larger than life, you know, um, a kind of lurid and, and more comical tone. And so I seized the idea of, of, of Finn McCool kind of lifting um, one of the little conceits from Flann O'Brien's novel, but then putting it to totally different purposes in, in the context of, uh, you know, a, a one man insurgency in, in Nazi Berlin. There, there's a quote that I want to um, to ask you about. Um, Whenever we fight for something, we always fight against something, whether we want to or not. Conversely, whenever we fight against something, we're unconsciously fighting for something, but there's no way of telling if those hidden fours or against are going to be any better than the fours or against we think we're battling. And then you know, you, you goes on to talk about the 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 damnedness of uh, of choice and yeah uh, on on. Uh, you, you almost get a feeling of nihilism, um, you know, uh, but you you balance this entire book with very, very deep um, philosophical questions like that with it, lots of humor. And, um, you know, you you really balance out um, the. Uh, kind of, the you know, the, the horrific nature of so much that went on there with with humor and you let the reader off the hook. Um, over and over again uh, to kind of let us um, come to the next scene with uh, with a cleared palette, so to speak. Mm. Um, is humor something that that uh, that you think about in the writing? Uh, you know, do you do you you know well, those are like five scenes that were heavy. I need to 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 mix it up, or is it just something that comes out of your nature and 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 therefore out of your writing? Yeah, that's a great question. I I think it's 
more intuitive for me in the sense I can't, I don't ever set out to calculate like, okay, now this scene needs a bunch of jokes, you know, or, <laughs> uh, um, that would be, that would be strange. I wonder if some people operate that way, but uh, for me, I think it's really just like you suggested, kind of, you know, an expression of, of my own disposition. My, my, in some sense, I'm, um, I just am trying to kind of keep myself engaged and entertained. And I, I'm some, you know, someone who's, who's drawn to humor. I love laughing. I love making people laugh. Um, I love seeing the kind of humor in, in, you know, in absurdity and in the, the darkest moments. Uh, and I think, you know, I think the human condition is something that, that requires laughter if, if we're not going to fall into despair. So, so I think that part, I don't think I'm able to write a novel. And in fact, uh, you know, ha having tested this a few times, um, I just don't think I have it in me to write a, a completely serious, sober novel. Um, I just, uh, the, the humor is embedded in it, just like it's embedded in me. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm trying to, uh, I, 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 like you said, I think there there's room for laughter in even the the darkest grimmest subjects not necessarily it's not making light of those subjects but rather it's it's uh, it's you know kind of punctuating it letting letting the air out um f finding a way to to to, to laugh a amid all the the devastation and desecration right right well when you're hearing this episode the torqued man is available everywhere uh we're gonna have links to it in the show notes where you can grab it in kindle edition or you know, if you want to hold the paper in your hand, uh, also auto audible audio book uh, as well, or go visit your local bookstore and uh, support local uh, bookshops for sure. Uh, Peter, the the audio book is, is releasing simultaneously with the book. Have you had a chance to listen to it yet or hear any samples? I haven't yet. I'm so excited to. I, I, I know who our reader is. It's the incredible John Lee. Uh, and I was able to, to hear samples from his previous books to choose him for The Torqued Man. And I was just thrilled that we got him. So, uh, yeah, I think on the 11th, I will be listening to, to John Lee. Uh, read the torch man with delight yeah i've i've had a, a a physical arc of the book for a couple of months now and uh and i i can't wait to hear what he does with it that's going to be fascinating i'm adding that to my audible uh cue uh, as we speak great um, peter if folks are just learning about you i know this is your debut novel and you know they want to follow along and 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 see where you go next and and you know what kind of journeys you're going to take us on from from here out is, is there any place online that they can follow you and, and connect with you and follow your journey yeah absolutely the best place is probably my website petermanbooks.com and uh, i'm also on instagram kind of sporadically it's really the only social media presence i have uh with any kind of regularity and that is p man underscore instant I believe underscore grams, not the most memorable of, of <laughs> handles. <laughs> but if you look up P Man Instagrams, you'll you'll see more to see. Uh, I, I I do comics and cartoons and stuff. You'll see more artwork than than literary stuff on that one, and as well as just me being you know a goofy person in the world. <laughs> um, but yeah, PetermanBooks.com will serve all of your uh, authorial needs. Excellent. We'll link all those places in the show notes, show notes to make it easy for folks to find you. Um, Peter, I love the book Torqued Man. Uh, I've got it sitting prominently on my shelf here, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be passing uh, out copies of this to, to people throughout the year. I know they're going to love it. Um, we're going to send everyone to see you and to pick up their copy of the Torqued Man. Peter, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you so much, Hank. I really appreciate it. It's been great. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane Series. They made instant coffee and laid blankets over a pile of hay. He helped Kate pull off her boots. She volunteered for first watch, but Jason couldn't sleep. Talk to me, he whispered. Kate sipped her coffee. She sat silhouetted against the soft navy sky. A field of stars hung above her. The constellations peered in through the windows and slats. How about a story? Sure. My mom used to tell this one. It's the legend of the Star Maidens. He watched her words as she spoke, her story illustrated by puffs of vapor that mixed with the steam of her coffee. 
Long ago, a Mohican brave became lost in this valley. He'd followed a red deer deep into the woods, but the deer had vanished, and as twilight fell, he lost his way. He searched the heavens. He saw a bright star and followed it. It shone upon a clearing in the woods. Spook rock lay at the center, emanating magic. And in the starlight, he discovered the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. He discovered a star maiden. She was dancing with her sisters, and all seven were naked. Oh, really? Jason whispered. Seven naked star maidens? Shh. Why do these things never happen to me? The brave decided he must take the star maiden for his wife, so he seized her and threw her over his shoulder, and she loved him for his courage. They married and had a son. Then what? Then it gets sad. The star maiden missed her home. She gazed at the sky every night. She loved her husband and her baby very much, but she missed her sisters, and she especially missed the dancing. So she snuck away one night and returned to the sacred rock, and she begged her sisters, please appear, please appear to me for one last dance. They came to her and took her into the sky. Kate's silhouette swayed. One last dance. It was wonderful. And when the dance was finished, they sent her back to earth. She thought that she'd been away for only a little while. But that one dance had taken many, many years. She ran back to her husband, back to her baby, but they were gone. Her home was empty. The hunter had stopped waiting for her. He'd given up hope that she would return. He'd taken their child and had left with his tribe. One last dance had cost her everything, and she had no home at all. Jason could sense something roiling inside Kate, some brew of feelings that the story had stirred. He wanted to leap up, to grab her and carry her off, his star maiden, and wife. She climbed up to Spook Rock. She heard no music, only wind. She died there of her grief. She dwindled and lost her star form. She became a will-o'-the-wisp, fluttering between the trees. And see that constellation? The Pleiades. Those are her seven sisters, watching down from heaven. And, to this day, if a girl has lost her true love, she can go to Spook Rock and dance, and the star maidens will bless her. They'll grant her one wish, any wish at all, except one. They can't make her true love return.